referred to in the Quran, chapter 33, verse 37. It is, it is attested in numerous hadith, traditions of Muhammad. It is in the earliest biographies of Muhammad. It is in the earliest histories written by pious Muslims. But the fog of deception is so thick that this gentleman thinks he can get away with acting as if I, through my black Zionist arts, have cast it into these books somehow and made millions of Muslims around the world believe it. Now this in microcosm is what we're facing in all discussions of terrorism and the jihad around the world today. People are so anxious to believe falsehoods and half-truths and people are so uninformed about these issues that they are falling for deceptions of the most naked kind. This has to stop or the clash of civilizations will certainly be upon us and we will not be the victors. Thank you very much. We will have some time for questions. As always, we have microphones that we would ask you to wait for so that our audience outside the building can also hear your question. And as they always say on Jeopardy, we would indeed appreciate it in the form of a question. And we would ask the courtesy of at least identifying your self name or some affiliation, even if it's nothing more than John Smith, Washington, D.C., that would be helpful. And I'll start back at the back. Matthew Ballon, Heritage alum. Uh, you said in uh, the... Uh, Iranian premier's letter to President Bush that he had free will in the matter to convert to uh, Islam. I wanted to, uh, to hear your uh, thoughts on that comment because I thought that there was no free will according to Islamic t teaching. Well, that's actually something that throughout Islamic history, going back to the earliest days, has been a point of controversy because there are many quotations in the Quran that, uh, that teach free will and many that teach an absolute determinism. And uh, there was a very large schism and controversy over the Qadaris in early Islam who taught that there was free will and they ultimately were the losers in the, in the uh, controversy. Um, however, there is generally accepted, particularly uh, from someone who's not speaking as a theologian but speaking as a pious layman, as Ahmadinejad was, I believe, uh, generally accepted the idea that there is free will um, and that certainly the choice must be made. But he also said, as I noted, that there are consequences for the negative choice, in which I believe he was referring to Muhammad's dictum that one follows the invitation to Islam with warfare against those who reject it. Uh, Dr. Spencer, my name is Kevin Mooney with the Cybercast News Service. Um, this past election, I understand a Muslim was elected a member of Congress, and I'm wondering if that opens the door to any untoward influence of U.S. policy that would concern you. Well, you know, one congressman is one congressman, and there are 434 others. My concerns about Keith Ellison are about the money he's taken from the Council on American Islamic Relations and uh, the fact that the Council on American Islamic Relations has never come clean about the fact that uh, two of the, the co-founders came from the Islamic Association for Palestine, which was a Hamas group, and uh, that Nihad Awad, one of them, has uh, declared his support for Hamas in the past, which he only disavowed recently in the, uh, uh, during the time of the Ellison campaign, and that uh, several uh, CARE officials have declared that they would like to see the United States become an Islamic state even by peaceful means. I'm glad that they want to do it by peaceful means, but I find that the fact that they share the same ultimate goal as the jihadists, I don't find that reassuring. And I would like to know what Keith Ellison's ultimate intentions are. Would he like to see the United States Constitution replaced by Islamic Sharia law? And I think these are questions, unfortunately, that people were afraid to ask him because they didn't want to be politically incorrect and be tarred as bigots. Well, you know, there's no bigotry in trying to defend the United States Constitution and in trying to be alert to possible threats to it. President Kennedy was very forthright in dealing with the religious issue when it was completely spurious and based on prejudice and hysteria and real bigotry towards Catholics. When you have Islamic spokesmen around the world saying they want to establish Islamic law over the West, it is not at all bigotry to ask Keith Ellison what he thinks of that. But it hasn't been done yet, as far as I know. Um, Al Milliken, affiliated with Washington Independent Writers. Those that promote democracy and even look at that as a kind of religion, 
How do you reconcile their thinking with going into Muslim-dominated societies? How can democracy not support Sharia law when the majority of a population is Muslim? Democracy will support Sharia law. It has supported Sharia law. Sharia law is the highest law of the land. No law can be made that contradicts the principles of Islam according to the Iraqi constitution and according to the Afghan constitution. And people were fooled. They thought because the Afghan constitution in particular also guaranteed freedom of conscience and freedom of religion that that was at war ultimately with Sharia. Well, we saw which one ran, won out with the Abdurrahman case when a convert from Islam to Christianity was placed on trial, a trial with a death penalty offense for converting. It showed that Islamic law reigns supreme. We have seen that again and again and again. And so uh, every time there is a democratic election in the Islamic world, the, the jihadists have either won or made significant gains. This is, they obviously have the initiative in the Islamic world today. And so, you know, I wrote before any troops were in Iraq, I wrote in early 2003 that any attempt to democratize the uh, Islamic world, and Iraq in particular, would fail because Islam has a character and always has had a character as a political and social system, as well as an individual religious faith. Now, I, am, uh, I appreciate the President's strong stand against terrorism, but I think that it, we need to defend ourselves and consider that American defense is our first priority and not, some, not undertake these Wilsonian schemes that I think are doomed to failure at the beginning to try to remake societies in, in the Islamic world. Uh, he likes to invoke Japan and Germany after World War II, but in Japan and Germany after World War II, the ideologies that fueled the militarism that had led to the war were discredited. The emperor said he wasn't a god. Nazism was broken. Nobody's going to stand up in 1946 and say he was a Nazi in Berlin. But political Islam has not been discredited. It's not even been challenged. And so how can it do anything but win out? Hi, I'm Deborah Weiss with the Center for Security Policy. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the mosques and madrasas in Pakistan, and I think you said Egypt, are yes. uh, teaching radical Wahhabi Islam, and I know Nina Shea is very focused on um, trying to get the Saudis to stop sending the radical books to the mosques and madrasas here, Yes. 80% uh, of which are very extreme. And my question is, instead of focusing on how to force other countries not to teach it or how to force other countries not to send things here, what can we do to stop this country from having 80% of radical mosques and madrasas, and why can't we do it? Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. I think we can't do it because of the fact that this is a religion, and people think, well, this is freedom of religion. We can't interfere with freedom of religion. But you know something? Just to take a very small example, the year one in the Islamic calendar, you know that there's, a, there's an Islamic calendar that differs from the calendar that we use. The year one is not what you might expect. Sometimes when I'm speaking around the country, I ask audiences, what do you think the year one is in the Islamic calendar? And people invariably say, oh, it must have been when Muhammad was born, or when Muhammad died, or when Muhammad got his first revelation from God. Actually, it's none of those. The year one in the Islamic calendar is when Muhammad became a political and military leader, when he fled with the Hijra, when he fled from Mecca to Medina and became for the first time a political leader, the leader of a polity. That's the year one, and that, I think, is an essential, uh, there's encapsulated in that an essential point, and that is that Islam is political inherently. It's a political ideology as much as it is a religion in the Western sense. And it needs to be approached by the government, by law enforcement as such, and subject to all the regulation of a political group. And I think that would do a great deal, were that approach adopted, to clarify what we can.